Welcome to the Hingham School Committee <laughs> meeting, the March 22nd, 2021. Um, this meeting is being held remotely as an alternate means of public access pursuant to an order issued by the governor of Massachusetts dated March 12th, 2020, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. You're hereby advised that this meeting and all communications during this meeting may be recorded by the town of Hingham in accordance with the open meeting law. If any participant wishes to record this meeting, please notify me at the start of the meeting in accordance with Mass General Law, Chapter 30A, Section 20F, so that I may inform all other participants of said recording. I know Harbor Media is on here tonight and I, the, they're recording. If anyone else is planning to record the meeting, could you either um, unmute yourself and let me know or um, use the raise hand function? Okay, seeing none, I'll take a motion to enter to executive session. I'll make a motion to enter into executive session and to reconvene an open session for the purposes of approving minutes of the executive session held on March 15th, 2021, and to discuss a memorandum of agreement with the Hingham Education Association Unit A, the public discussion of which will be detrimental to the committee's bargaining position. I'll second. Thank you. And we'll do a roll call vote. Michelle Ayer. Aye. Jen Venom? Aye. Ness Currenti? Aye. Carlos De Silva? Aye. Libby Lewicki? Aye. Liza O'Reilly? Aye. And I'm an I as well, Carrie Nee. Okay, so we will be going to executive session for anyone who's out there other than Harbor Media. Um, we will be back to open session at 7 p.m. Good evening, evening, everyone, and welcome to the March 22nd, 2021 uh, school committee. Uh, we are reconvening from executive session right now. Um, because there was nobody on the line before, I'm just going to read the statement really quickly. Um, this meeting is being held remotely as an alternate means of public access pursuant to an order issued by the governor of Massachusetts dated March 12th, 2020, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. You are hereby advised that this meeting and all communications during this meeting may be recorded by the town of Hingham in accordance with the open meeting law. If any participant wishes to record this meeting, please notify me at the start of the meeting in accordance with Mass General Law Chapter 30A, Section 20F, so that I may inform all other participants of said recording. I know Harbor Media is recording tonight. If anyone else is planning to record, could you, if you're on the panel, could you unmute yourself? Or if you're um, an attendee, if you could just use the raise hand function. Okay, um, seeing none, I'm just going to ask the school committee members that are participating remotely to identify themselves. Uh, Michelle Ayer. Hi, Michelle Ayer. Jen Benham. Hi, Jen Benham. Ness Carenti. Hi, Ness Carenti. Carlos De Silva. Good evening, Carlos De Silva. Uh, Libby Lewicki. Hi, Libby Lewicki. Liza O'Reilly. Hello, Liza O'Reilly. And I'm Carrie Nee. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, the next um, the next item on the agenda was to discuss a memorandum of agreement with the HEA Unit A regarding the reopening of schools and the 2020-2021 school year and act as appropriate. Um, we added this to the agenda under open meeting law. We have to post 48 hours in advance of the meeting and we hoped to have uh, uh, something to vote on tonight. We're not quite there yet. This, uh, we're working on details with the HEA and we're moving forward with the plan we voted on last week. Okay, number five is the approval of minutes of the school committee meeting held on March 15th, 2021. I move that we approve the minutes of the school committee meeting held on March 15th, 2021. Thank you. I'll second. Uh, roll call, Michelle Ayer. Aye. Jen Benham. Aye. Ness Carenti. Aye. Carlos De Silva. Aye. Libby Lewicki. Aye. Liza O'Reilly? Aye. And I'm Carrie Nee, I'm an I as well. Okay, um, item six is questions and comments. The Hingham School Committee encourages community engagement and welcomes questions and comments as agenda items are discussed at the meeting. In addition, we have set aside up to 15 minutes at the beginning of this meeting for questions, comments or questions that fall under the purview of the school committee and are not already on tonight's agenda. If any guests wish to speak, Please raise your hand using the raise hand function, state your name and address and address your comments to the chairperson. Comments will be limited to three minutes per speaker and must relate to topics within the scope of responsibility of the school committee. As established by Mass General Laws, the responsibilities of the school committee are to one, select and evaluate the superintendent, 
Two, review and approve budgets for public education in the district. And three, establish educational goals and policies for the schools in the district. Speakers are encouraged to present their remarks in a respectful manner and to consider privacy interests of others. The public comment period is not a time for debate or response to comments by the school committee. The school committee is not adopting or endorsing any of the comments made during the public comment period. So with that all uh, said, I see Nicole Little, or Lytle, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Hi, good evening. Nicole Lytle, 27 Elm Street. All three of my children attended and then graduated from the Hingham Public Schools. That education served them well through college and beyond. As a parent, I appreciated the expertise, professionalism, and compassion of my children's teachers. Today, I'm proud to count many of those same people as my colleagues. I teach at the high school, and I feel fortunate to be part of such an accomplished staff. I humbly offer my views of the current plan, not as an official representative of the faculty and staff, but as a community member that has listened to her colleagues and shares many of their concerns. I wanna be clear, at no time has any teacher I've spoken with asserted that hybrid learning is preferable to in-person. No one has refused to come back to work. What I would like, what many of us would like, is consideration in the following areas. The first issue is timing. We are returning to full in-person at a much faster pace than DESE mandates, and there are very real concerns that come with this rush to return. With the current schedule, teachers will not have completed their vaccination cycle. You are, not, you are considered fully vaccinated two weeks after the second shot or single J&J &J shot. I will not be fully vaccinated by the fifth and many others are in a similar situation. With 100 cases at the high school this year and two teams currently quarantining, this is not a moot point. Full return is scheduled for the day after April break. Many families will choose to travel. That is their choice, but experience has shown us that after breaks, there is a clear rise in quarantines and positive cases. Wouldn't it be less disruptive for the classes to push back these dates by two weeks? The second issue is that there, there is no explicit plan. We are being asked to agree to a vague plan that does not account for an increase in risks and possible impacts on the successful mitigation strategies already in place. The schools are moving forward to, to, are moving to three feet distancing. The CDC now recommends six feet between adults in the school building and adults and students. That means I will still be teaching from the front of the classroom. Six feet is recommended in common areas such as school library, uh, lobbies. That is a standard that will be difficult to meet if both cohorts are in the building. Halls will be congested during passing and many teachers have to change classrooms. And finally, six feet would be maintained when masks can't be worn, such as when eating. Lunch will look very different. Students will not have the social lunch break they're hoping for. We do not believe that you're providing a clear picture of what this next phase will look like. There are numerous questions about duties, teacher planning periods, workspaces for teachers that are not teaching, schedules and student overflow. Those are students who exceed capacity in the classroom, so we'll have to zoom from inside the building. These are just a few of the unresolved topics. In, um, in closing, we want to come back, but we want to come back, come back in a way that addresses our concerns about our safety and the safety of our students. We want to come back in a way that is meaningful and will positively impact the educational experience. At this juncture, why would you, why would you not delay the return so that teachers can finish their vaccination cycles and that the plan for return can be fully defined and explained to both the staff and the families? With that information, every member of the school committee can make an informed choice about what is safest for themselves and their own family. Thank you for your time tonight. Okay, thank you for your comments. Um, I don't see any other hands. Um, next is, let's see, the superintendent's report. Um, 7.1 is the health metrics update. Dr. Austin. Thank you very much and uh, good evening everyone. And I'll ask Sherry to please uh, post my PowerPoint up there. Okay, so thank you. Uh, just 10 slides tonight, uh, just as an update. Good and through. Uh, just once again, the uh, as we always do every week, the, um, the uh, town of Hingham uh, COVID is still in yellow, although we are uh, reducing from one week to the next on the number of cases per 100,000, moving from 25.3 to 24.1 last week. Uh, and our test positive rate has decreased from 2.68 to 2.67. 
Over the last week, we had 10 additional cases uh, last week in the, in the schools. Um, of that, uh, all 10 were uh, student cases. Uh, as you see, moving from 175 to 185 overall for students. Uh, and then the uh, staff cases have remained very consistent for the last three weeks at 51 uh, per week. Uh, and as you can see, once again, we're staying relatively um, even with last week and the numbers we've had um, over uh, the 3 through 7 through 313 date through the 314 through 320. Uh, as we just heard about quarantine, yes, there are lots of students in quarantine uh, right now, and you can see that uh, that number far to the right of 314 to 320 uh, is a uh, 160 students currently in quarantine across the district, 68 at the high school, uh, 24 at the middle school, uh, and then that number goes down until uh, you see uh, the highest one at East with 30, where we did have a classroom that quarantined um, due to a, a suspected case. Uh, so therefore, the, the numbers, as we've talked about this in the past, one of the risks of coming in is obviously increases in the potential for quarantine because there's uh, less distance between students. Although I will say that the majority of the high school cases are from athletics and not from inside the school. So we, as always, we uh, continue to review our uh, testing of uh, COVID-19. Um, we are actually having fewer uh, staff interested in testing. At one time, our max back on the middle of February was 206. Uh, this last week, we only tested 111. We can certainly test more. Uh, we plan on 200 per week, so I would encourage our staff who want to take part of testing to please do so. Uh, but as uh, we've seen in the past, we've had one positive case reported way back in January of uh, uh, on January 26. Uh, so we've had no cases and we've tested, we've run 1,516 staff um, testing uh, samples. Uh, so we have a 0.07% positivity rate of those tests. We've now ramped up our COVID-19 student pool testing. We continue to ramp up. Uh, to date, we have had a 487 uh, all tested uh, in 64 different pools. Uh, to date, we've had 100% uh, negative tests uh, come out of those pools, uh, which is very good news. So our positive test rate is 0%. So I want to talk a little bit about COVID. So we are, as we transition to full uh, time attendance in just a few days or weeks, the importance of surveillance monitoring for COVID-19 in schools is uh, incredibly important. And I want to illustrate that again today of how important it is to participate in testing. Although staff and educators may be fully vaccinated soon, uh, students are still not eligible to be vaccinated. We've seen an increase in cases in COVID-19, both in Hingham and in other uh, Massachusetts community. Uh, although that's uh, not quite true, we stayed the same on our cases in Hingham. And even one community had to close schools recently due to an outbreak uh, outside of our district. We must maintain or remain vigilant in order to ensure that our schools remain open. Uh, and we need your help as parents uh, and community members to do that. If you decline the pool testing, we ask that you reconsider now that our schools are beginning to open full time. As the results have shown, we have had no pool returns as positive, and this is very reassuring to our educators and families. And it's also a positive step to ensure the health and, health and safety of all individuals in our school system. As a reminder, all students are between now three and six feet in the classroom as we begin to, to bring in full time. We have seen a major increase in the number of students and staff in quarantine as a result of the positive test in the community. None of these have come from pool testing. The more and faster we know, the more efficient we can be in isolating the issue and protecting our staff and students. We also have some new travel requirements that I wanna talk about. So monitoring the spread of COVID-19 in our schools and community is essential for the safe operation of our buildings. We ask that everyone in the HBS community please adhere to all advisory uh, in relation to travel and COVID-19. As of today, March 22nd, all visitors entering Massachusetts, including returning residents, are advised to quarantine for 10 days upon their arrival. Travelers in the following categories are exempt from this quarantine advisory. 
Travelers who have received a negative COVID-19 result on a test administered not more than 72 hours prior to the arrival in Massachusetts. Travelers may also test out of, a negative, out of the quarantine advisory after arrival in Massachusetts, as long as they quarantine until receiving a negative test result. Anyone who is entering Massachusetts for 40, uh, fewer than 24 hours, any, or they've left for uh, 24 hours, and anyone who's returning to Massachusetts after being out of state for fewer than 24 hours. Travelers who are fully vaccinated, for example, those who uh, have received two dice doses of either the Moderna or Pfizer COVID-19 vaccines, or who have received a single dose of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine 14 days or more ago, and who do not have symptoms. And finally, just as a reminder to everyone, the Cushing Street testing facility in Hingham remains open on Mondays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays until further notice. If you have traveled, please test and await results prior to returning to school unless you have met the exemptions listed above. Again, this is for your, um, just for, for information out there. We need to have everyone remain vigilant. If you traveled, please test uh, and get the results and then return to school when those results are negative. So increase in in-person learning for all students. Uh, as we laid out last week, uh, is that we beginning on March 29, all in-person middle school students will attend school from 7.30 to 11.55, uh, five days per week. Uh, beginning on April 5, all in-person uh, HHS students will attend school from 8 to 12.05, which is their current schedule, five days per week. It is our plan that on April 26, all in-person HMS and HHS students will attend school five days per week. Uh, adjusted schedules will be forthcoming soon. We continue to work on those uh, and, and, uh, and we'll get those to people as soon as possible. Families must commit to have their students either remote or in-person for the remainder of the school year. If a family wishes to change from remote to in-person after April 17, those requests are subject to space availability and may take up to three weeks to comply with. If you have an HMS or HHS student and have not completed the return survey, please do so by the end of business on Wednesday. To date, we have received about 70% of the potential surveys back, approximately 3% of, of the Hingham Middle School and 9% of HHS wish to remain in remote learning for the of school year at this time. Again, these numbers are very important to us, particularly as we look at the space numbers in our classrooms and being able to determine uh, how many students will, or how many students would need to access it from a remote um, location in the high school. Uh, so getting that information to us as soon as possible is incredibly helpful. And that's it, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Austin. Does anyone on the committee have any questions or comments? Liza? Yeah, I have a question. Um, regarding the quarantining of the athletic teams, do we know, did we have a case on our team that required the quarantining or did a team that we were competing against have a case that then required our teams to quarantine? So you asked the right question since Jim Quattrimoni is on the call, since I don't know. Uh, maybe Mr. Quattrimoni, you can help me with that. Uh, thank you, uh, Liza. In both cases, uh, there were a positive case on, on each particular team of Hingham students. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carlos? And I think uh, just, just a comment, you know, um, it's, you know, disappointing that uh, this is happening with athletics. Um, but I'm not surprised because I have been seeing pictures in the paper on the first page of the students and coaches talking to one another without a mask. So to be quite honest, shame on us. And I, you know, I wanted to take the, event, you know, the opportunity that the uh, athletic, athletic, athletic director is here to ask him, reinforce with the coaches and the uh, students that it is imperative that they wear masks regardless. My son plays in college and they wear masks throughout the whole time. And uh, I also wanted to, you know, reiterate that, you know, I hear complaints of students leaving the buses uh, to go home. And as soon as they step down, the parents that are waiting for them are talking to one another without the masks. So if we want uh, our students back in school, we must be responsible and wear the masks all the way up until this is over. It's not over. 
So respectfully, I would ask for people not to just conduct the pool test, that is important, but let's really uh, do the things that uh, will help us go back to school. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Anyone else on the committee have any questions or comments? Seeing none, um, I don't see any hands. If anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hand. Um, Okay, I'm not seeing any, so we will move on. Thank you, Dr. Austin. Um, 8.1 is student communications. Do we have Carly on the line? Oh, there she is. Uh, Carly Hi. Kennedy is in the waiting, she's in the uh, participant side, so. Yeah, I think, yeah, there we go. Hi, everyone. Hi, Carly. Um, so as for student communications, um, two weeks ago, the school committee chairs held um, two student forums one on Tuesday the 9th and the other on Thursday the 11th. Um, students were given the opportunity on these days to share their questions and concerns over Zoom. And about 20 students showed up to both of them um, and almost every one of them were active participants and clearly expressed their, their enthusiasm to go back to school. Um, it was inspiring to listen to um, my peers talk so passionately about a cause and um, it made us very excited that in-person learning is on the horizon. The high school students were very grateful to the school committee for organizing that forum for us. Um, our Best Buddies program participated in their polar plunge yesterday, where they dove into the freezing cold water at Nantasket Beach. Many students and teachers showed up to support and cheer on our 15 plungers. Um, the original goal was to fundraise $500, but they ended up raising just over $6,000. And all those proceeds will go to the Massachusetts Best Buddies Foundation. Many students at our school community have recently participated in the annual Saving by Shaving event, where for each shaved head, $5,000 is donated to Boston's Children's Hospital. Um, and then that's incredible this year because among the list of notable participants is our Hingham Boys Lacrosse team. And almost every single player shaved their head, raising a remarkable amount of money this year. Um, and then lastly, our Unity Project team has been making strides to promote inclusivity and acceptance in our school building. Recently, a survey was sent out to all students asking them to share their heritages, heritages so that flags representing every country that our students are from can be displayed around our school building. Thank you. Thank you, Carly. And I, I just will say again that how much I enjoyed um, attending the student forums and hearing uh, your input. Um, people had very thoughtful comments and they're clearly very excited about going back to school, which we, we share that. Yes, um, definitely. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thanks so much, Carly. Okay. Um, does, oh, does anyone else have any comments or questions for her? Sorry. Okay. Seeing none. Um, communications received by the superintendent. Do you have anything, Dr. Austin? I do not have any tonight. Okay. Other communications? Does anyone have other communications? I just wanted to um, note that earlier today, the education subcommittee of the advisory committee voted to recommend the proposed school department budget that was requested um, and that they will re recommend that to the full advisory committee. Um, and just wanted to thank the subcommittee for their support and engagement. And it was a very thoughtful budget process as we work through it. And um, I think it, because of the process, I think we're all better for it. Um, so the next steps for the uh, education budget, um, tomorrow night, uh, which is March 23rd, the Board of Selectmen will vote on the total town budget recommendation, which will include the amount allocated to the school department. And then again, on, Mar on Thursday, March 25th, the full advisory committee will vote on their total bu town budget recommendation. And then finally, um, a town meeting, which is scheduled for May 8th with rain dates of May 15th and 16th, town meeting will ultimately decide what the budget looks like and what the school department budget is. So just wanna thank everyone who's been engaging in this process. Um, next is unfinished business. We don't have any uh, new business. And 10.1 is to receive the fall to 2020, 2021 high school coaching recommendations. And I believe that is coach Q. Yeah, within your, uh, it's in your um, packet tonight and we always uh, give you the, the full list of coaches, et cetera, for the fall list. So you don't need to vote on those as your information. Do you have those? Okay, thank you. 10.2 uh, is to hear a report in the high school athletic program. 
Thank you. Before I, I'll introduce uh, Mr. Quattromoni, which I think probably doesn't need any introduction on his own, but um, I, I want to say um, before we start tonight that this has been a work for um, really that started quite a while ago with one of the um, first uh, meetings I ever attended of the Professional Coaching Alliance uh, that uh, we've been part of and, and uh, listening to uh, Mr. Quattrimoni talk about the, uh, his need or, or require, or I shouldn't say that, his desire to make sure that Hingham has the very best athletic program uh, possible. Um, and uh, I, I commend him for that. And uh, so with that, I will introduce him, uh, Mr. Quattrimoni, who will also be assisted by uh, one of our uh, teachers of the high school, uh, Dr. I want to Fazirio. I want to make sure I got that correct. Uh, if that's close, but uh, the two of them will be uh, giving you a presentation. So, Dr. Mr. Quattrimoni. Thank you, Dr. Austin and Madam Chair, for the oppor opportunity to present to you this evening. If I can, I can I begin sharing a screen for the presentation. Uh, yes, Sherry, could you? Again, thank you. So joining me in presenting uh, preliminary results of our athletic department self-study using focus groups is Dr. Phil Struzero. Uh, Dr. Struzero has worked as an English teacher at Hingham High School for the last 15 years. He played college football at Tufts University and is currently the president of the Eastern Massachusetts Football Officials Association. More importantly, Dr. Struzero completed his doctoral dissertation using mixed methods research techniques like leading focus group interviews. Uh, to change gears here, personally, this is a very meaningful project to me, this self-study. I know of no other athletic department that is doing this work, and I cannot thank Dr. Struzero enough for being a tremendous resource in this project. I anticipate these efforts will continue for years to come in large part due to what I've learned from him in this methodology during our time together. So our goal in the self-study has been to better understand the experience of student athletes at Hingham High School. I've recognized that it is easy to get feedback from coaches and captains. Creating ways to generate genuine productive feedback from parents and non-captain student athletes has been more challenging. Initially, we tried to use a survey after speaking to a parent group that felt it would be our best tool. We gathered a committee that worked over the summer and came to the conclusion that using focus groups could be the answer to this challenge. Just as importantly to me, this would be an opportunity to further develop relationships with families and student athletes within the district. Developing meaningful relationships is a theme for us within the athletic department, and we'll talk more about that later on. After identifying our goal, we developed questions along the following theme. What is the nature of the experience of our student athletes? And what can we do to make that experience better as parents, coaches, and administrators? I'll turn it over to Dr. Phil. Thank you, Coach Quashimoni. Thank you, Dr. Austin. Thank you, Chairwoman Nee. Thank you, members of the school committee for inviting me here to speak with you this evening about a project that I hope will help a lot of people. Ideally, we would have been able to run a, a classic empirical experiment where we ask a question, we hypothesize what the answer will be, we manipulate an independent variable, watch its influence on a dependent variable, record our observations and write up our report. But unfortunately working in educational environments um, with many variables isn't that simple. So we decided to use grounded theory. Um, Sharmaz 2009 talks about grounded theory as a, a useful tool because knowledge is contextual and people make meaning when they interact with their environments. And in addition, when you're in the beginning of a research cycle and you don't even know what all of the variables are or all of the questions you should be asking are, this method can help. So what we did is we conducted focus groups. We're still in the middle of conducting focus groups. And then when we transcribe the data, we code it. Coding is just categorizing, uh, putting it in simple categories. Then once all the data is properly placed, you go into it and you do focus coding. Focus coding uh, is similar to analyzing a novel. Uh, you look for 
repetition, you look for moments of connection, you look for moments of disconnect, you look for any interaction between one code and another, and then the themes, findings, and possibly theories emerge. Uh, one important element of this is to, uh, it's a reflexive method where you're collecting data and analyzing it simultaneously. And in order to deal with a validity threat, such as, well, you're just finding what you're looking for, we're constantly checking ourselves. And this presentation this evening is an example of that. We plan to write up a brief summary of what we present to you this evening and share it with all the participants we've worked with so far and solicit their feedback to make sure that we're telling the story as it must be told. So we, oh, coach, this is you, right? This first one is you, Dr. Struz. All right, thank you. So we developed an interview protocol after we were clear on what our research goals were, and we decided to pilot it with the coaches. And the reason we wanted to pilot it with the coaches was to build their trust. We didn't want them to think that this was an evaluation or a witch hunt. Uh, they helped us make sure that the questions were clear and that they were connected to our research goals. We conducted that pilot focus group on 3 December 2020. So on November 25th, uh, an email was sent to student athletes and their families asking if they would be interested in participating um, in our focus group project. All that have expressed interest will have the ability to participate before this round of our project is in the self-study is complete. These focus groups will continue to run through the spring when we would provide uh, a final report. So we've run three, we've run, we ran the, um, the pilot, as Dr. Struzero mentioned, and then we have run three parent student athlete focus groups on January 11th, February 25th, and March 4th, and we ran our coaches uh, focus group on March 4th, March 8th, I'm sorry. Our participants uh, of the 12 student athletes that have participated to date, they represented 26 athletic experiences, 19 parents representing 68 athletic experiences and 39 children. And in our coaches group, we had seven varsity coaches to, to, to kick off that end of the project. Like I said before, this is a reflexive analytical method where we're collecting data and analyzing it simultaneously. And I'll, just to briefly summarize, we record the Zoom meetings, all of which, and, and Coach Quattrimoni will talk to you about this, all of which have lasted twice as long as we initially planned for, which we think is significant and we'll talk about later. Once the recordings are completed, we transcribe them and then we begin to categorize the data. Once it's categorized, we go into those categories and we analyze it. And to check our biases and to strengthen the validity of the project, we meet weekly, we share our progress, we share passages that we have questions about, and seek feedback and interpretation from our colleagues, Coach Quattrimoni, Mary Ellen Holler is another, and that work is ongoing. To date, we have 23 codes. When we first started, we took our codes from the MIAA Learning website and also from a National Federation of High School Studies that talked about the outcomes for student athletes because of their participation in high school athletics. Those were very basic codes like leadership, confidence, higher GPA, community service, school pride, um, pretty vanilla stuff, if you will. Um, but what has emerged from our work, I think, is more interesting and more helpful to all of us. Uh, things like adversity, things like connection, coaches' connections to student athletes, student athletes' connections to their teammates and connections to role models, student athletes' connections to alumni parents' connections to coaches, confidence and self-efficacy. Those are some of the codes that have emerged from our work. These, this is a, a, a data table that summarizes our results so far. We have analyzed nearly 30,000 words. At this point, the top five codes are adversity, enriching experience, connections between coaches and athletes, connections between teammates and parent behavior. Those are the top five. And if you'll notice adversity, 7,100 words. 
are in that code, representing 24% of all of the data that we have collected and analyzed thus far. Just behind that is enriching the experience, 6,500 words, which represents 22% of all the data that we have analyzed. And finally, the connection between coaches and athletes is 3,200 words or 11% of all of our data. So if you look, 57% of everything that has been said so far in hours and hours of interviews is about adversity, how to make the experience better for the student athletes, and the connection between coaches and athletes. After that, the numbers drop precipitously. And you'll see if you look at the percent of data, 7%, 7%. And if we flip to the next six codes of the top 10, 6%, 5%, 4, 2, 2. And these codes are life lessons, connections to role models, relationships between parents and coaches, confidence, and internal competition. So the code that provided the most volume in terms of comments and word count obviously was adversity. And in analyzing that data, I'd like to offer the following summary um, of the comments. Parents, coaches, and student athletes agree that adversity is an opportunity to learn and to grow. However, there is a disconnect between coaches, student athletes, and parents about how to communicate effectively in terms of a student athlete's role on a team. Parents want to help their student af athletes advocate for themselves, but they don't always know the best way to help. Further, communication breakdowns can lead to burnout for our coaches. As educators, we should explore ways to establish and keep open and appropriate lines of communication between all parties. Clear expectation and boundaries need to be established and enforced. Without them, the consequence may be that the district will lose talented coaches. Finally, the data offered a powerful insight into the stress of coaching during the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And so we're gonna share with you some of the, the quotes that help us uh, uh, come to the conclusions that we have with the analysis in this preliminary uh, presentation. Parent One offered to us, as a parent, it's really gratifying to see your kids work through that adversity, to see what they become when they're done. Parent Two offered the following in regard to a student athlete's role on a team. I would say the other challenge is poor and inconsistent communication. Know where you stand. The communication not always being there, and that can be hard on all of us, but especially high school kids. Coach One offered, I don't think there are a lot of boundaries with parents. I mean, I think that parents get very, very emotional. You would be surprised how parents reach out to me. And then coach two, the biggest adversity I've faced in the last 12 months, trying to pull a program together where we couldn't meet when we had our banquet outside in a field in blankets in November. I went home that night, took the next day off from school and slept for 14 hours. I will note Dr. Austin, that this particular coach is not a teacher in our district. So maybe we can just look past that day off uh, in, this, in this situation. Uh, the second uh, uh, most popular or most frequently referenced quote is the idea of uh, uh, using athletics to enrich the overall high school experience and comments to talk about ways that we can enrich the experience in itself. And parent three offered to us, in a normal world without a pandemic, there's 30 hours a week that I don't have my kids. And I want those 30 hours when they're with their teachers, when they're with their coaches, who I look at as interchangeable. They are bringing my kid up. To see a coach tell my kid to speak clear and take his hat off, I missed that. The coach didn't. There's a life lesson right there. The next most frequently referenced code is the connection between the coach and the student athlete. And student athlete one offered to us, I feel coaches are available because I like to talk to them after practice. I also think it is crucial that you can talk to a coach about any part of your life and they will listen. That's just excellent. This is a particularly impactful quote to us. I, I agree that it is excellent. And one of the things that we talk about uh, with the coaching staff quite often is meaningful and developing meaningful relationships with their student athletes. When we succeed in developing these meaningful relationships, issues uh, tend to, to get taken care of. It's when we fall short uh, that things can escalate at times and, and the experience is not what we would, we would want it to be.
you've seen three of the main findings, three of the main topics that are emerging from this data, but there are some outliers that we're looking closely at. Just because they're not popular doesn't mean they're not meaningful. One came up and we felt it was very important was the representation of female coaches on the staff. Another was the absence of words. In 30,000 words of data that we have transcribed, coded and analyzed to date, we have a code for winning. There are only 264 words in it. Winning isn't everything in this district. What seems to be clear is that parents, coaches, and student athletes are united about the importance of life lessons learned because of their participation in interscholastic athletics as a part of the Hingham Public Schools. Finally, when we asked student athletes to tell us what the most meaningful experiences were in their time in Hingham, this is what one student had to say. And I think it's especially powerful because I think it's a moment that we should all celebrate because we've been working so hard through this pandemic. The most meaningful thing to me from a kid's perspective has been my parents being able to watch me play. Not taking that for granted and being able to make them proud. Whether I play well or not, they will still be there to have my back and support me. It's been a hard year for all of us, but I think this moment is especially poignant because we need to take time and celebrate that we're doing a lot of things right. If a young man says this unprompted, it can't be all bad. Thank you, Jim. So when we look over this preliminary data, there are implications that we obviously should be considering. Each of these focus groups were scheduled for 45 minutes. Every one of them doubled that. And I think one of them would, would have pushed even further if, um, if we hadn't you know, referenced the time that we were, we were taking up at that point of the night. The, the message was clear, though. People wanted to talk, and it was it, it was refreshing conversation without urgency to to the moment, without emotion, and it was it was just genuine to be able to listen to people and hear what what they had to say, understanding that our motivation was simply to improve the experience. Without question, we will continue the self studies to get to a final written report for the committee in June with an action plan and recommendations for changes up to and potentially including policy changes. We'll consider the idea of offering a monthly coffee with the athletic director. And we will look to further develop clear and consistent standards for communication across the department on all levels. Last year, we, we started using some of our staff meeting time uh, to share best practices from coach to coach. We'll continue that and further develop the work focusing on communication and feedback. One of the best practices that, that I feel came out of uh, the focus group that was particularly notable is, is many student athletes and parents talked about the difficulty of the trial process and, and the, the, of, of getting cut. And, and, you know, in a district like ours that with the, with the participation rate and the, the level of play that we have, it, it, it does happen. And it's a hard thing for us, for us to deal with. But one of our programs had a particularly impressive way, according to the, the data collected, that every, the entire coaching staff met with every candidate for the team, shared with them what team they had made and why, or that they had been cut and why. Um, something that we will be further looking into as we as we move forward here. We will develop a mentoring program for our coaches with zero to three years of experience within our department. I think that our staff would report to you that I'm particularly accessible to them, but I recognize the benefit of being able to learn from a peer. We'll explore professional development for staff around communication on all levels, and we'll continue to work with student athletes to help build strong connections with their coaches. We hope to continue research efforts like this for many years to come. And as we do, we can narrow our focus. We can explore the relationships between the factors that we've found 
And we can also start to manipulate variables to see if that has any impact on outcomes. We would propose to return to you uh, with a, a final written report and a presentation in June of this year. We will finish interviewing all of the volunteers on the initial round of interest. Again, anybody that uh, has expressed interest will be interviewed. We'll finish our data, a data analysis and again provide a final report. And with that, again, I thank you for um, the opportunity for Dr. Struzero and I to present and we are ready for any of your questions. Thank you very much for that presentation and all the good work you're doing um, around that. Does anyone on the committee have any questions about this? I have one. Uh, yeah, yes. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I'm just curious, was there um, any team that wasn't represented by parents or students? At this point, there would be teams that have not been represented by parents or students. By the time we get to the end of the project, um, whether it's the volunteer pool or needing to go out to recruit some student athletes to get coverage, all will be represented. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Liza, did you have something? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, thank you for uh, starting this work. I know that people have been questioning about it for a while. Um, so I have a couple of quick questions. When you had parents and students, were they separate? As so parent, parents only and students only? We ran the parent, uh, the parent and student groups together. And I think, doc, Dr. Shuzero, do you want to comment just on, on what we used, you know, the, the format that we used to, to try to best get the students to open up? Yeah, absolutely. To summarize the interview protocol. So we separate, at first, in an ideal world, we'd have all three parties together, but we realized practically that wasn't a good idea. So we had the coaches in, in a group by themselves. And then we had we had the student athletes and the parents together. And it, part of our interview protocol was to actually have the parents speak first. And we explained when we started the, the focus group and talked about the protocols that we wanted that, not because we didn't want to hear from the students, we wanted to hear from the students, but we thought it would be helpful for them to listen to the adults talk about the experiences, to just get them warmed up, get some words in their heads, get their ideas and thoughts flowing. And we found that that it has worked well so far. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe as you start going and students get more comfortable and understand what you're doing, they may have different comments without adults there. Just something to consider. Um, and then with the coaches, was it the mixture of man or coaches of girls sports and boys sports together? Or yes. did you only have, so then that's another one of going forward. If you, maybe there are different issues with the girls teams and the boys teams, just thinking in the future. Um, yeah, there, there are different dynamics or even by season, um, you know, as you're, as you're moving forward. Um, you know, when, and then another, so comment question for you as you're moving forward, when you had the term adversity on that list, when I first read the draft, I was thinking, oh, this is about people talking about the power of through sports, overcoming adversity and challenging okay. yourself. And that those, the positive benefits that you learn from sports, you know, you have a losing season. Well, you know, next year you're going to have a winning season, but hearing your presentation doesn't seem like that's what people were talking about. It seems like people were just talking about adversity and the problems they were having in the program. So I appreciate that question, Liza. There, there is a fair amount of, of comments that, refer to adversity just as you have described it. Um, and I think that, you know, as we present adversity, that's where athletically our minds, our minds go. What I wanted to do was to share uh, some information in terms of the adversity that maybe the participation itself does provide from time to time. Uh, 
right. um, where that I think is a little more specific to us um, and what we're trying to accomplish with this project in, in improving the overall athletic experience for our student athletes. Okay. So um, yeah, I, I guess I'd want to see as you come back in June, if, if you can, you know, separate it, you know, it's, it's a tone of, of using the word, but um, it's a different feeling and it, it's a different outcome when you define the word in a different way. So um, I appreciate you doing the analytics, but if we can get to subject matter, breaking it down a little bit more, I think that would be great. Um, and also it would be interesting if, as you move forward in the years, you know, we've had a very difficult year. Are we getting different outcomes because overcoming pandemic issues versus normal times? Um, but that's just something for the future. Um, so I, I look forward to seeing more. Um, I, and also I'm curious as to, you know, when you, when you hear about winning isn't everything, then what are we going to do with that going forward? And talking to our, our coaches, our athletes, our, our school community, the parents, the young kids in town of, is this going to be a shift in what we want Hingham High School sports to focus on versus, you know, focusing on championships and how are we going to do that? Um, and so, yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting as it evolves, but um, I appreciate you taking the time with all these people and getting feedback because the only way you can learn is from listening to people. So thank you. Jim, Absolutely. can I jump in on that one real quick too? I think, Liza, I think if you had to summarize a study, what we're finding is it's all about, you know, it's all about communication and connection. Um, and a fancy word for connection could be social capital. Um, now, like you said, that might be contextual. It might be because of a pandemic and the kids feel isolated. And this is one of their ways to reconnect with their friends and do something that they love. So it'll be interesting in the years to come if that's the case. The one thing I'd wish I had said about, about winning um, is that I think it's ironic that, or it's not ironic, it seems ironic on the surface that no one seems worried about it, but we're the winningest program in division two. We win all the time. And I think the message may be when you do it the right way, when you focus on the right things, when this is an extension of the classroom where you learn things and make friendships and connections to adults that will last your lifetime, the winning follows. Mm -hmm. And I think we understand that, which is great. Um, so thank you for your feedback. Well, yeah, and I, I, I hope you also think about when you're hearing that, you know, was it, winning isn't everything, it does also come down to what's the practice schedule with the lights on the multipurpose field. If you're going to keep the lights on till nine o'clock to allow for practices to go on that late at night, that might prohibit a student from doing jazz band or a club because they have to go to sports practice instead of going to a club meeting or another program, then they can't do both. And so does that then our athletics prioritized over all the other things that we do in high school? Liza, and that was one thing. Of some of the things that, you know, as we go on, it's going to take a long time, but that's a small thing that or it's not a small thing, but that's an element of, you, you know, what are we driving towards with athletics? That was one thing that a parent did bring up. It was just one piece of data and in a more, um, elaborate presentation we could talk about, but they asked for guidelines when there are schedule conflicts with debate team or with orchestra, how can you work with the coaches and the advisors and the, and, and, and the directors to figure out what gets prioritized. Right. right? And, I, and I think that's part of the overall communication and guidelines that can be developed moving forward. One thing I will say too, to deepen the analysis, there's a darker side um, to the competition. We have a code called internal competition, which you saw is in the top 10 which is a pressure that children feel they perceive to play hurt because they're worried about losing their spot in some of the most competitive programs. And so that's one thing, again, we're going to learn a lot more about it as we get more data, but it's, it's an important one to watch. 
Yeah, yeah. That final report is is going to be pretty comprehensive here, and just in terms of what we'd uncover of uncovered to date. Never mind with the additional focus groups that we will work through. Well, good. I hope that um, I encourage people to participate, and I hope that they feel comfortable um, sharing even something as as difficult as that of being afraid of getting hurt or you know not being able to play, and yeah, that's tough on kids. Um, but we want everybody to be healthy and to have fun, too. So I'm going to recognize Carlos first, but next. But before I do that, I just wanted to, to the adversity point. I just wanted to commend you both for highlighting that there are two way, two definitions of adversity, and I think to in order to improve a program, we have to put out the things that are challenging, and you know, and the areas that we need to improve. And I just think it was great that you highlighted that, and we sort of look forward to seeing more. All right, Carlos. Um. Again, uh, to both of you, great presentation. Thank you. Um, just a question, actually, right before um, um, popping the question to you, I text my son, uh, who is a former uh, player, uh, soccer player in, of Hingham, um, and he's the, uh, the captain of the La Salle University uh, soccer team. Um, I asked if he got, uh, you know, questioned, surveyed, and I, he said he did not. So did you not include uh, Luminis on this survey? We did not. We did not in this uh, particular focus group uh, project here. We did not include alumni, but I do think that that's an area that we can look at moving forward, Carlos. Um, there has I, been some I discussion would, about that. I would respectfully ask that you do, because you know, obviously, uh, the alumni uh, have a lot to contribute. They have been part of the program. They moved on, like my son. There's many others that uh, remain uh, leaders within the colleges, you know, playing sports still because of, you know, what they got involved in Hingham. Uh, HSP has been a huge uh, supporter of our schools, which uh, once again, I want to thank them. Uh, but recently I did watch a, a video uh, where they brought in some uh, alumni uh, with a coach, uh, or a couple of coaches there. Uh, great, uh, you know, uh, segment, you know, bringing alumni to talk about the experience and sort of like encourage others uh, to, you know, seek, uh, you know, colleges to continue playing sports. Uh, so, yeah, most definitely I would consider, you know, um, including alumni as well. And just to pick back on what Ness uh, asked, uh, please be sure to include every single team out there so no one feel excluded. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm looking forward. I have been looking forward to this presentation today, and uh, we will continue to look forward to the final presentation in June. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else on the committee have any questions or comments? I, I just had one um, when you were talking about communication and um, how, what are, how, what efforts are you making to make sure that students who aren't captains maybe um, get, if there's, if there's outreach to them to include them in this process? So what I've done after sending the initial email is I've, I've gone directly to our coaching staff and asked them um, to make recommendations and put forward student athletes that would be interested that aren't captains. We run a captain's class right now that, that meets on Wednesdays. Um, before the way, the way it's running right now is it's meeting two weeks before a season starts. So we start to lay in the, the curriculum, give the kids some training on how to be a more effective leader and then work with them and our coaches collaboratively to create projects that they work on together. Conversations are easily more easily started because both know that the conversations are coming from the curriculum and the, and, and the work that we're doing. So as I said, we're able to to get feedback and get messages from our from our captains. But I'm to answer your question, going directly to coaches and having them talk to their kids about it and recommend and or have the kids directly reach out themselves. Sometimes the email for me just isn't attractive enough to get the to get the interest. Okay, All right. Michelle, do you have something? I do. Sorry, just kind of came, well, came to me a little while ago, but I thought I'd bring it up now. Um, just as you're going through this, I don't know if it's coming out organically or if it might be out in the, be included in the final report, but I'm just wondering, has there been any, are any of the conversations talking about equity in funding and like booster organizations and, you know, that type of perspective? We don't have, from we, we don't have a code for that. 
Uh, we okay. have not heard that. Okay. Um, I think that the closest that I would say that we've come is that um, maybe adult relationships with, there, there were a few comments where adult relationships uh, with coaches, there was a feeling that maybe that had an influence over outcomes of, of the selection of teams. Um, but nothing um, that, that is along the line of what you, of your question. Thank you. Okay, I see one hand up. Uh, Heather, if you could unmute yourself. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to have my hand up. I apologize. I'm enjoying the presentation. Okay. All right. Thanks, Heather. <laughs> um, next, Casey, if you could identify yourself, state your name and address, please. Uh, yes, my name is Karen Cunningham. My address is 118 Ward Street. Just a quick question. The forum that you did, is that just on the varsity teams or does that take into consideration JV also? It takes into consideration JV also. Um, to date, we have not interviewed any freshmen, which is not ideal. Um, but I think that we understand that the pandemic experience is, is very different. And that's their only experience with us at this time. Uh, where I think, with some exceptions, when we're asking the questions and seeking the, the input of the, of the parents and the student athletes, we're, we're finding that they're remembering back to when things were a little bit more normal and less, um, and the, less of a need to adhere to modifications and, and precautions. Okay, thank you. Um, I am not seeing any other hands up. Oh, Ray Estes, if you could unmute yourself. Thank you, Ray Estes, 92 Fort Hill Street. Um, thanks, Struz and, and Q uh, for doing this. Uh, just full disclosure, I participated uh, in one of the focus groups. Um, I'm, I'm happy that this is being done and I look forward to the full report in June. Um, I don't think that I was aware that it was gonna be structured in a kind of mathematical formulaic coding way. I thought it would be more about the kids and the relationships and what was going on and what could be done to improve if it needed, if anything needed to be improved, what could be built on, what could be, you know, that kind of thing. And, and some of the things I, I heard are kind of getting to that. But I also think that the questions that were asked in the focus group were limited. And I know that there are a lot of things out there that maybe wouldn't get addressed by those particular specific limited questions. Um, and I also know that there are things going on over the years, some of which kind of prompted this whole thing to happen. Um, and it's a good thing that it's happening. It's long overdue. But there are some of those things that have gone on, I think, need to find a way to be addressed in this process as well. With And, and talking to current athletes may not do that. Talking to current parents may not do that. Um, so I look forward to a, uh, you know, a full, a full report that is a little less mathematical and a little more personal, um, and a little bit broader in scope, um, that maybe touches on some of the issues that I know a lot of us know are out there that maybe haven't been hit on, uh, by what's been represented tonight, but thank you. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Um, okay, I don't see any other hands. Um, so I just want to thank you both again for um, this preliminary report. And I'm also looking forward to the full report in June. Um, and so next is item 10.3, which is to receive notification of the resignations for the 2020-2021 school year of an administrative assistant and three paraprofessionals. So I'd like to thank everyone for their service to the district. Um, number 11 is subcommittee and project reports and warrant signs. So we'll start with Michelle. Uh, you know, I don't really have, I don't really have anything to report. <laughs> We've been meeting weekly, so. <laughs> yeah, I know, exactly. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing you didn't know a day ago. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, Jen? Uh, nope, I don't have anything. Oh, well. Yeah. Well, I, I attended the uh, Alton PTO, which was great. Oh, yeah. But I'm my section. Okay. Is there anything that came out of that or? Um, uh, no, it was just a, it was a great meeting where we were a lot of talk about the, the vaccination appointments that the PTO was, um, fabulous doing, helping with all the 
booking of everything. So very appreciative to them on that. Um, oops, is that Sorry, fine? <laughs> no, it's me. Uh, we went through, there's a lot of great activities coming up. The PTOs are doing a really great job at modifying their um, programming. There's still a lot of um, online activities that they are still doing. And we also um, had a nice discussion on um, including for families that are still remote for including, making sure that they are included in all of the P2 activities that are going on. That's great. Yeah, their contributions have been so important this year. They always are, but especially this year. Uh, Ness. Yes, I have a few things to report. Um, so in your packet, you have a couple um, reports for the finance subcommittee. I had already presented on our meeting from um, March 12th, but we met again, uh, Carrie, Jen, and I met with uh, John Ferris and Dr. Austin on the 12th. And um, this was our finance committee right before we took a vote on the budget. So we just confirmed where the budget was going to end up at the 8.16%. Um, and um, recognizing that this is a recovery budget and that there's, we do have some known needs um, going into next year and going into the um, strategic plan process, but then thought that there were going to be coming, there were things that were going to be coming out of the strategic plan as well um, that we should keep a note of um, for next year's budget process. And we also talked about the incoming kindergarten packages. They're due at the end of March. Um, the incoming first grade is actually where Doc, Dr. Austin had proposed from the prior year where we thought we might be. So it's one thing that we want to keep an eye on because it it, it sounds like it could even be more first graders, but we'll see. Um, and then we talked about the, we're awaiting the determination of the federal government um, grant that we're gonna be getting. Uh, and that 20% would need to be applied to any learning loss. Um, and that we thought that the HTSS would be, would qualify for that. Um, and then you've got two warrants in there as well for finance. Um, I also have HEF. Uh, we met last Wednesday. Most of the grants that were approved have been paid out. Teachers will have the benefit of those grants uh, when the kids go back full time. Um, so that should be exciting. And they will be kicking off their capital campaign in April. So stay tuned there. Uh, also met with East Student Council, uh, School Council. Um, they are working on the survey that's going to be going up to the parents and the um, equity task force. There's been lots of PD lately and um, Dr. Jamie and I were able to attend a session last Thursday that we had gotten through METGO, um, but we are one of five districts, I believe, that um, was granted this opportunity to work with Harvard, the Harvard Rides program. So we spent four hours on Thursday and then we have five additional sessions coming up um, throughout the, the next coming months. So that was really, that was great. And actually part of that process, we had two students with us, which was really exciting to hear their perspectives as we talk through our equity process. So that was it. Great, thank you, Ness. Uh, Carlos. I don't have anything, no. Thank you. Okay, Libby. Uh, yeah, so um, the community outreach subcommittee is meeting tomorrow at 11, and uh, we are going to hear mostly from Dr. Labois um, about a, a private school that we're going to start looking into. It's called Root Pods. And um, then also, we're going to talk more about the website and the um, developments for it. Um, and this is an interesting uh, development in that we're going to look for ways to enhance accessibility to uh, people with uh, in disabilities to the website. And um, it's been a long road getting this uh, website up and running. So when I first started on the school committee three years ago, we were um, just getting into the budget, uh, $30,000 to hire a company to give us, to help us to get a new website because the old one was so cumbersome and outdated. 
And so then the second year we uh, went through a, a process where we chose a company called Sterling and then they helped us to develop the website. And this third year we've got that up and running and it's up and running and it's really so much better and so much more accessible to so many people. Uh, but with it still, um, you know, has room for improvement and uh, making it more accessible to people with disabilities is uh, um, another big push that we're working on. And so we're going to look more into that tomorrow and hear from Dr. Jamie and we're excited about that. Um, so that's it for community outreach. And then um, South School Council is meeting on Wednesday. And I'm looking forward to that. Great. Thank you, Libby. Um, let's see, who do we have next? Um, Liza here. Um, uh, no more master plan. I encourage people to read the draft that's on the town website and salary negotiations. Wednesday, we have negotiations with the bus and van drivers, and we're waiting to schedule our next meeting with HEA unit A too. So that's it. Thank you, Liza. Um, and I will just mention uh, the South Shore SNAP, which is a special needs athletic partnership met um, a week ago. Uh, the spring programs for students on the South Shore with special needs are uh, registrations open for soccer and baseball. And the summer program, which runs um, along with the ESY dates um, for the public schools is also, the registration for that is also open on, on their website. And also SNAP will be partner, partnering with the Hingham Sports Partnership for a golf tournament this year on uh, June 17th. So save the date. Okay, with all of that being said, um, anyone have anything for 48 hours? Okay, seeing none, I'll take a motion to adjourn. Make a motion. Make a motion. No, go ahead. <laughs> I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll second. <laughs> Thank you, Libby. Okay, Michelle. Hi. Jen? Hi. Ness? Hi. Carlos? Hi. Libby? Hi. Liza? Hi. Hi. And I'm an I as well. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Thanks. Good night.